It is Friday, June 2nd, 2023, and welcome to episode 227 of Fault Lines, the National Security and Suits podcast that gets you quickly up to speed three times a week on the national security and foreign policy debates shaking up America. I'm Jamil Jaffer, NSI's founder and executive director. I'm joined by special guest NSI senior fellow Andy Kaiser and NSI's deputy executive director and TV super spy Jessica Jones. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about AI and its potential risks. Just a couple of days ago, the Center for AI Safety uh, put out a statement, the following statement, 22 words, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. This is not the first time we've heard breathless concerns about uh, AI. Just over the last few weeks, uh, we've seen a statement from over a thousand uh, experts, CEOs and the like, uh, including Elon Musk, uh, suggesting that we should have a pause in AI development while the, while the government uh, takes some time to look at it and regulate it. Uh, the Center for AI Safety uh, is not a bunch of uh, random people. There's at least three Turing Award winners. That's a, a very prestigious uh, computer science award from the Association of uh, the ACM. Uh, authors of standard textbooks on AI and the like. CEOs and executives from OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, DeepMind, and Anthropic all signed this uh, Center on AI Safety uh, statement of concern about the risk of extinction. Um, so this is a serious uh, topic, um, and we thought, you know, look, if, if AI really poses the threat of extinction to humanity and, uh, and you know, if, if Elon is out there saying uh, that there ought to be a pause um, and, you know, the government clearly is thinking about what it might do in regulation, the European Union is thinking about their AI Act uh, in the U.S. We know the administration uh, has uh, at least a National Security Council-related memorandum uh, uh, they're in discussion in the White House. Uh, there, we've heard uh, through rumors there might be something about um, about uh, about uh, the, the export of AI algorithms, or obviously about domestic constraints. Um, and Sam Altman, the, this, this, the head of OpenAI, at a Senate hearing uh, just last week, uh, testified that he thought the government ought to issue licenses uh, for uh, to AI companies to develop AI um, only if they demonstrate that they're capable of doing so in a safe and and competent manner. So uh, there's a lot of debate about this. It's not surprising, I think, that the, uh, that the leaders in this field who already have a jump think regulation should come in. Perhaps it might keep competitors out. Uh, who knows why they're saying this? Uh, but it's interesting that some of the leaders in this field think that that's what ought to be done. So uh, we have one of our guests, our guest uh, drafters in with us today, Andy Kaiser. Uh, Andy, let's turn to you first. What do you think about this whole uh, this risk of AI and whether we ought to take a pause or the government ought to jump in and regulate? Yeah, I, I'm of two minds of this. I mean, I do think we're dealing with something that has a non-zero chance to end humanity. So we probably ought to. Ought to pay oh that. my god! Wait. <laughs> um, do you wait, hold, hold, wait. Do you really think like like you? I mean, are you worried about the like the rise of the killer robots and like they'll they'll realize they become sentient and they'll like they'll like kill us because they're smarter than us? Is that what you think? Like Skynet? I think that's not a zero percent probability, and you have some very smart people who are wow. who worry about this, um, including. The godfather of, of AI, he's referred to as a, a Canadian professor who was leading Google's project, who most people think is the most advanced in this field. So when guys like that and Elon Musk and others who are uh, brilliant in their own in their own right scientifically, uh, you know, sound the alarm on the threat and people like Jen Easterly at CIRPA do the same, I think we ought to listen. I, you I mean, know, I, I, I just don't buy it, right? This whole idea that, like, I mean, we're not even talking about systems that actually have artificial general intelligence or is it even approaching that, right? What we see happening today with these large language models is they're guessing what word comes next in the context of the words that have come before and other words they've seen together. There is no aspect of artificial general intelligence. It, it sounds really great. It sounds human-like. But, I mean, I think you're being fooled by what you're seeing and what feels very human. It's not – this isn't – AGI by any stretch. It was just, just I mean, yeah. what do you think? Well, I, I think some of what the, the tension, the fear is, is that the, the rate of progress in the last three years is has sped up so quickly that what might seem crazy, general AI, is not as far fetched or far out as they would have thought. And I think we I mean the fear celebrating. Thing, you know, I think there's there's a lot of I mean, there's a lot of, you know, um concerns from short term to like, you know, disinformation to the end of the world, right? There's a whole spectrum of concerns that are related yes. to AI. So if there are, you know, oversight or regulations, you can calibrate them to whether it's short term or medium term concerns. And maybe we don't have to worry about Skynet tomorrow. Like this admin may not have to worry about that. But um, I, I, you know, I, I think that to Andy's point, smart people are thinking further out than right now. 
Look, I, I don't doubt that there's some chance that down the road in five, eight, 10, 20 years, right, there might be some possibility of, you know, some some aspects of, of artificial general intelligence, but we're not even anywhere near that. And, and this idea somehow that, A, we ought to pause. First of all, like, like you can put the genie back in the bottle and just stop work, because, by the way, if we stop work, let me tell you who's not going to stop work. The Chinese are not going to stop work. A lot of people aren't going to stop work. So that's that's silly, I think. That just puts it in a competitive, puts it at a, at a competitive disadvantage. And by the way, even if we pause, that would suggest that, well, then somebody has to step in before we unpause. And who's going to step in? The U.S. Senate? Congress, I mean, the clowns that can barely get the, the debt limit done, right? Or the Biden administration, because it's so confident on so many things. Like, oh, look I, at their Afghanistan pullout. Look at their Afghanistan pullout. That went so well. Let's put the, these guys in charge of deciding. <laughs> let's put these guys in charge of deciding AI regulation. Like, that's a good plan. I, I, I agree that a six month moratorium just on its face seems like a random amount of time to just pause. Like, there's, there's, what does six months give us at all? What is that? What does it actually impact? So I agree that like, this, the claim of, that position to me is strange. And I'm not saying that we should stop moving forward on development because to your point, I don't think other countries are. China is definitely not. So I didn't say that. I just think that there are valid concerns. All right. So the valid concerns, Andy, what do you think? I mean, should the government, should the government regulate in this space? And if so, like who in the government has the competence, even the competence, forget the idea of what to do. Who is competent in the government to do this and keep up with the technological evolution? Because I don't see a single person, not that there's all smart people in the government, but the government writ large, I mean, like, that's ridiculous. That's a joke. No, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the to the threat. I am. I tend to agree with you as as to I worry as much about the solutions. Like, I do think we're in a competitive race with with China. No question, they will not stop. The it's it'll be very difficult technology to keep in the box. I think it is different than say quantum computing or something advanced like that. Where if we win that race, we can lock in standards that advantage the West and disadvantage. Right our Chinese adversary. I don't think AI is in that box, though I'm not probably technically sophisticated enough to make that judgment, but that's that's how I feel. But at the same time, I do I am sympathetic to this argument that, my goodness, as we're proceeding apace down something that is clearly uh, improving year over year, and where does that end? And should we think about at least some belts and suspenders to ensure uh, we can control the technology? Yeah. Well, look, I think I think at, at a minimum, you know, what may make sense is for some sort of a risk framework. We saw NIST do this uh, in the cybersecurity domain um, and some light touch guidance uh, would not be the worst thing. But I think that should be industry driven um, and get sort of people in talking about this and really thinking about this. The government doing it on its own, I think, is a is a terrible idea. Just any last thoughts from you on this, on this AI regulation question? No, I mean, I, I hope that Jamil's right and that, that this technology isn't the end of the world because, I mean, I love fault lines, so we can have this end, guys, like three times a week. There you go. <laughs> That's a wrap. Thanks to Brooke Khan from NSI and Claude Jennings for their help producing today's episode. Please join us again on Monday for another episode of Fault Lines, the podcast that gets you smart fast on the national debates shaking up America. Fault Lines is also now up on YouTube, so check out our podcast video on NSI's YouTube page. And if you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.